How you doing? Hey, how are you? Hey, David. Good. I'm having a wonderful day. I hope you are as well. I want to dive right into the questions because we already have some <laughs> folks asking them, but uh, also have some some pre prepared ones to buy folks some time. This first okay. one is, you know, I'd love to hear about your backgrounds, given that you've had senior roles at developer centric companies like Twilio, wow. etc. You know, feel free to to let folks know a little bit about yourself. Awesome. Well, I started my career in finance, so I spent spent about the first decade on the investment banking side, working at a firm called Goldman Sachs. Um, there, I worked at a ton of technology companies, and I really fell in love with one, uh, a company called Success Factors. Um, I ended up taking the company public as a banker, and, and ended up joining them as an operator. And so from there, I've been uh, had the good fortune of working with great companies, great founder CEOs, great teams. Um, we ended up selling success factors to SAP. I was there for a little bit, uh, running the cloud business unit. Uh, after that, I partnered with Jeff Lawson um, at Twilio as uh, Twilio COO to help scale out the business, especially on the commercial side. I also went to another developer platform company called Mapbox to help them really scale out, again, their commercial functions. And um, you know, since last year, I've been starting my own uh, company as a FinTech infrastructure platform company called Bond. Uh, we basically enable non-banks to be able to offer financial products. We take all of the infrastructure and the relationship with banks and the various technology vendors and put it under one roof so that um, our tech companies can offer out things like credit card, debit cards very easily uh, to their end users. I love that. You have a variety of experiences. You know, the, Being at a developer-centric organization where developers are your your target audience if you will that that's something that not everybody has the opportunity to experience i think that's awesome and in addition ipoing being on the finance side as well as on the operating side you have a lot of perspective and experience i'm going to invite everybody who's listening you know anybody that has a question you know who wants to know about roy's experience could be a twilio could be a success factors could be going ipo there's plenty of questions to ask feel free to put them on the side of your screen in the q a tab ask questions that you have upvote questions from others. And until then, I will ask more from my own set, but feel free to, uh, to ask your own questions as well. So uh, this next question, you know, hearing about your, your backgrounds and your perspectives, I imagine that you've seen different models for how engineering managers run their teams. I'm curious to hear, you know, what different models have you seen, you know, yeah. what work, which ones don't, just kind of curious to get like the, the lay of the land. Yeah, that's a great question. I think obviously different organizations have kind of different DNAs and as a result, various functions kind of uh, are structured differently. Uh, I think in more traditional uh, enterprise software companies, there are, you know, uh, th there's the kind of commercial team, the, the customer facing team, they work with customers, get their, get their requirements, talk to product about it. And, you know, product then lays out a roadmap, a development roadmap, and work with the engineers to basically go execute on, on, on those products. And I would say, you know, a lot of software companies are built that way and I think built very successfully. Um, you know, with developer platform companies though, what I find is developers are closer to the mix in the beginning. The reason obviously is because the end customers we're looking to serve are developers in and of themselves. And so having developers in the front end, so be it in sales conversations or even as part of the product ideation process is actually very, very useful. And in fact, they add a lot of great um, insights as to how we should be structuring the product in, in many cases, also structuring the deals such that, um, you know, it is the right outcome for the developers. And so, um, you know, I would say, you know, those are the two kind of different like rough models that I've seen. Hmm. And it's interesting, you know, knowing that you have this background, you know, you know the finance side, you know the business side, but again, you've dealt with developers as direct customers and you understand, you know, that side as well. We obviously have a lot of engineers and engineering managers who are, who are listening right now. Do you have any thoughts on how engineers and engineering managers can better understand the company's overall business? Yeah. Um, I would say, you know, get in front of the customers, get closer to the customers. I think oftentimes, you know, uh, you know, engineers work very closely with product to execute on the roadmap. Um, I think especially, you know, what I found is, you know, since COVID and everything's going remote, instead of sales teams flying all over the world, kind of engaging with customers, most of our conversations are 
remote uh, through Zoom and, and other and, and other uh, video conferencing uh, systems. And so, you know, this is a great opportunity for developers or engineering managers to kind of jump on customer calls, like raise your hand, jump on a customer call. It's much easier than before um, and, uh, you know, get, get right in the thick of things. And then, you know, the more context you have in terms of what the customer is looking for, the, the more um, productive and the more satisfying um, the build is going to be. It makes sense. I uh, reflect for myself, you know, just when I've been managing engineering teams and the individual managers or engineers themselves aren't, uh, you know, for whatever reason, aren't, aren't, reaching the level that one would hope for them to reach, et cetera. I've always found that um, connecting them and exposing them to the customers in some way, whether that be in a user study or or what whatever means possible, you right. know, that enables them to be more effective in the moment, yeah? Totally. And then I think the second is around just asking why. I think um, it, it always asks why, I think, especially on the engineering side, I think, you know, from the business perspective, from a customer perspective, there may be some ideas that get translated into product and the product roadmap. But you know, if you don't understand the context as to why you're building a certain things or or why it's being built a certain way, um, you know, I always kind of encourage teams to really ask why. Is in fact one of our uh, principles, uh, business principles, um, because until you understand the why, will you be able to kind of build the right thing for the customer? A hundred percent. It's so interesting how on the engineering side of things, sometimes we get so siloed and so in the weeds on something so specific that we kind of lose the forest through the trees so I can appreciate the value of, uh, of that principle. So I'm going to dive into questions from folks. So this first question from M, what is the development process, for example, Scrum or, or otherwise, what should that look like for a customer focused team? Yeah, I think um, a couple of things. I think, you know, having a small a team structure as possible um really drive uh, toward customer uh, orientation the reason is i think when you have smaller teams is less of a kind of a waterfall meaning like hey look there's a canonical kind of like right way of building something from someone be a product or the go to market teams and you just execute but instead i think when you have a small team um, the developers within that 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 small team now can basically participate in a lot of the decision makings. Um, you know, they are directly in front of the customer. They understand what is the what is the use case, what is the problem we're looking to solve. And not only are the team do the teams need to be small, but I think autonomous teams are also very important in driving kind of a customer focus uh, orientation because autonomy enables you to kind of coordinate with other teams. But you know, you minimize the dependencies. Um, oftentimes, I see kind of well, we're waiting on that team to do something, and so as a result, we're kind of like standing still. I think serving customers, customer focus to me means speed to delivery, speed to kind of going from idea to basically getting to what we believe the customer really wants, and um, you, you may not get it right the first time. Most companies do not get it right the first time. And most companies, even after they get it right the first time, is all about continual iteration and you know making the product even better. And so I would say, you know, small autonomous teams, I think, you know, um, you know, there was a saying back at Twilio, communicate via APIs across teams instead of having more meetings to kind of go discuss stuff. And so to the extent that you could build interfaces across different teams, that doesn't kind of necessitate kind of, you know, the uh, the, the meetings, I think that will kind of drive toward a, um, a faster response to kind of customers' needs. Um, and, uh, you know, I think from a, maybe there's not development process per se, but just how people make decisions. Obviously every day, be it engineers or engineering managers make decisions. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, we adopt here at Bond and also uh, at other companies I've seen that is effective is this whole kind of, I don't know if you've heard of this kind of type one, type two decision making, right? Where the type one decision are things that is not easily reversible versus type two decisions are things that, hey, look, you can easily reverse and you just iterate from there. And uh, I think a lot of companies treat a lot of decisions like type one decisions. Wow, once you make it, it's kind of set in stone. But in reality, if you think about it further, they're actually easily, you know, 
uh, reversible and you can kind of learn from it. And so, you know, back to the kind of time to kind of addressing customers' needs, like the more we can empower small teams to make decisions, in particular, there's plenty of these type two decisions all over the company. And so if you step up, make a decision, um, uh, that, that allows you to kind of, you know, move your team's kind of uh, mandate forward very quickly without kind of boggling down uh, with uh, other teams and the rest of the organization. I'm also reminded how autonomy is like number, one of the number one indicators of an individual's success on the job. So I mm -hmm. very much appreciate, you know, how important autonomy is. Yeah. It makes sense, you know, this idea. I, I'm actually not sure if I've, I've been, I'm familiar with the, that idea of type one and type two, um, you know, decisions, but it's a very simple way of looking at things. And 100%, I, <laughs> I certainly, I'm sure many of us on, who are listening have, uh, been in situations where there was a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of you know senior people involved to make a decision that you know someone might have treated like a type one decision but it was really a type two decision and you know you just want people to be able to move quickly so and it's actually pretty hard right i think you know as i reflect my own career when you start your career you feel like every decision is a type one decision Everything that you do, every mistake you made potentially is a type one decision that is not reversible. I think as you continue to grow in your career in particular, you realize through, you know, judgment that, you know, more and more of those decisions are in fact kind of type two decisions, not type one decisions. And so um, I think that's a big kind of a learning, I think, for folks. Like it doesn't matter if you're an engineer or anywhere in the org, but it, being able to recognize that and have that kind of judgment call, I think it's, uh, it's really important. 100%. This next question from Masanu, usually the sales or customer success teams are very cautious about letting engineers talk to the customers from their portfolio. How do you convince them, you know, that it's not too risky to do that? Um, what we generally do with any sort of customer engagement is we, we, we have a pregame, like we, we have a pre-conversation, like internally. So be it with customer success, our engineers, before we go into that customer meeting, hey, look, what are some of the objectives we are, we're trying to like uh, get across during this meeting? Um, make sure that you know there's like roles and responsibilities in the meeting. The customer success person is in charge of talking through these topics. Engineers are there to talk through these topics, you know, and you know also think through you know potential questions that may come back from the customer and who would hand to handle those. I think once you're able to kind of pregame like that, that, that meeting, I think your customer success team will be much more comfortable or your sales team much more comfortable around, you know, like various folks participating. I, I am always of the view that I want more people to participate than less. Um, you know, even if it's not a speaking role per se, I think you can learn a lot from direct customer interactions. 100%. This next question actually from the same person, but got a lot of upvotes, so I'm going for it. Um, after a certain stage, for example, the director level, mm -hmm. the C level sees you still as an engineer, but the engineers see you as an executive. How do you handle that situation where you're basically not belonging anymore to either group and how can you still be effective? Interesting. Um, yeah, so I think it, it, this is a this is a very interesting question because I think, you know, the reality is, you know, the teams that you directly manage will see you grow as a leader. You've taken on more and more responsibilities, your team's potentially like larger, larger now and your scope is, is, is broader. But um, I think your peers and or kind of like the, the executive level may be still stuck on when you first joined the company and oh, well, you started as like an IC or an, an engineering manager now that you're a director or um, uh, above, like they don't see that. I think part of it is, also raising questions that don't, that is not typically kind of an engineering question, right? If you start asking questions beyond kind of like the typical scope of an engineer, um, you're asking business oriented question, you're looking at the big picture and, and back to my original kind of fly around, asking why about certain decisions, maybe jumping into, well, why are we pricing the product a certain way? Why are, why, why are deployments done this way versus another way? then it kind of gets you out of kind of like that just pure engineering mindset. I think David, you, you talked about kind of, you know, you're, you're, you're in the weeds all the time, but like, how do you kind of get back to the forest? And so I think as a C level executives, like, you know, we, we dive into critical things, but we cannot dive into every single thing at that like level of detail. And so if you're able to rate, like elevate the dialogue that you have with, with executives, I think that's one way of kind of, 
um, getting you kind of the, the, the visibility you need as an executive? What I extract from, from what you just said is that kind of there's this level of, for lack of better words, empathy, which is something we talked about earlier today, but you know, where you're actually connecting and trying to absorb from the other person, right? And if that person is an executive, you know, it's like, what are you trying to do? Why? You know, and connecting there. And if it's an engineer, it's what are you trying to do? Why? And then yeah. if you're in that receptive space where you're trying to solve the problems of the folks around you, regardless of what level they're in, that they'll perceive you as useful, totally. helpful, valuable, and doing an effective job. Totally. And remember, like, I think the question was, you know, engineers see you as an executive, but like maybe the C level still see you as an engineer. Think about it like if, if you were that C level executive. What is that person, to your point about empathy, what is that person caring right now? Let's say it's end of quarter. They're really like, they, they, they wanna know like, are, are we hitting our numbers like for this quarter, right? So maybe like the dialogue that you're having with the C-level executive team is around kind of what they may be thinking about. So beyond kind of like your day-to-day -day duties, but kind of, you know, empathize like what, what, what that level of executives may be, may be concerned about or focused on. Sure. This next question from Alex, I can, I can sense from it uh, like a hint of, I don't know if I'd say pushback, but like just questioning something, which is, you know, the question is, why do engineers really need to be customer focused? Shouldn't they focus on building what the product owner tells them to, since the product owner is the customer expert and determines the product backlog? Like, why would it be necessary for them? I think to each their own, right? I'm not saying that's only one way of doing things. I would say, you know, at least a lot of the engineers that I've worked with where they derive a lot of satisfaction and understand more of the context about what they're building and why they're building it and how it's gonna get used. Um, and I think in the end, you know, it also enables engineers to, I think you derive, a, in, at least, you know, at least the people I speak with, like derive a little bit more satisfaction out of like the, 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 the product that they're building. Um, obviously, you know, being technical experts in terms of executing and, you know, piggybacking and, and leveraging kind of your product owner to kind of synthesize what the customer needs. You know, that will still happen. I'm not saying there's no more product managers, there's no more salespeople and engineers go go do everything. Uh, what I'm advocating for is, you know, more involvement with the customer. And, you know, why do engineers need to be customer focused? Uh, my answer generally is every single person in the company needs to be customer focused. It's not just really an engineering thing. Because in the end, your customers is who you're serving, is why you exist as a company. And so if you don't understand your customer, why, why do you even exist, right? So I think understand the big picture, understanding the customer is, to me, is pretty critical. 100%, and I, you know, I reflect on myself, you know, that when you're in the weeds, if you will, and you're an engineer and you're, you're getting things done, that, you know, sometimes you're fortunate enough to have a product manager or product owner that gives very deep details for every piece of what you're doing, but sometimes you don't. There's occasionally a product manager or two or three or four who doesn't provide that extreme level of detail for every edge case, or you encounter something that maybe the product manager didn't anticipate as you're building it. And that's one of those situations where I can imagine that if you have perspective there that you might be able to anticipate you know, a reasonable decision and for example be, be unblocked by taking a stab at it if you can't reach the the product person so totally. and i think it also gives like product a little bit more leverage when the engineers kind of can think through stuff so instead of kind of going really deep into a spec they could probably have a little bit the product managers can have a broader surface area as a result to tackle kind of other uh customer problems where the engineers can also dig in and you know fill in the gap so to speak uh, in, in specs that are maybe not as detailed, right? So, you know, I, I think it really depends on like the personality, but I mean, I think at, overall my, my, my philosophy has always been, it doesn't matter where you are, be it you're an engineer or a customer success person or, you know, a finance person, frankly, you need to be customer focused. 100%. This next question from Pavan, as a company CEO, how do you set up a successful company uh, you know, management between business and finance and technical leadership. You know, you you see so many different ways of of navigating that, of handling that. And you know, I think some folks who've never kind of been exposed to to stuff at that level are kind of curious, like how do you navigate that whole thing? Um, I think you know, back to transparency, right? Um, I think you know, the, at the at the team leadership level, we have a lot of transparency with with the leaders leading the kind of various. Uh, parts of the organization. 
And um, you know, we meet regularly, sometimes once a week, sometimes twice a week to kind of get all the different functions aligned. And you know, when I, when I work with my executives, I always say, when you come into this executive meeting, take off your functional hat. I don't care if you are the VP of engineering or the VP of partnerships or you're the head of finance, like take off that hat. You're, you're sitting in, in this executive meeting as an executive looking at this company holistically. So I always encourage folks like our head of compliance to weigh in on product, our finance people weighing in on sales, our sales people weigh in on engineering. I think I want people to be owners of the company holistically, not just owning a particular like function within the organization. And obviously we brought those leaders in for their expertise in those specific functions. But when we have a dialogue, um, as an executive team, I really want everybody to kind of take off that functional hat, really kind of think more broadly, because I've seen where places where, you know, as companies continue to grow, silos kind of continue to grow, especially across functions. And, um, you know, if you can't kind of get a line on one page at the executive level, it's very hard for the rest of the organization to follow. I'm reminded how um, something in kind of like human computer interaction land, you know, there's concepts called heuristic analysis where you look at a user interface and, you know, enumerate all of the ways in which it, it has problems. And, you know, the research shows that experts see only one set of these problems in a given UI, whereas novices, like people that are just totally new to the whole thing, see a completely diff different set of problems. You actually need both to be able yep. to see the full picture. And I'm reminded of that kind of as, as you're talking about, you know, on the business side, right? That even as an expert in something, there's something that experts don't see in their own domain because they've just kind of adjusted to it so much. And that's where yeah. sometimes having a novice or somebody in a completely different domain ask a question can actually surface something that mm -hmm. the expert didn't see. Yep, 100%. Great. So this next question from Ling, um, when you say small autonomous teams, you know, we were talking about, uh, you know, autonomy and autonomous teams before, um, they're just curious, how small are the engineering teams uh, at Bond? Uh, right now our teams are, depends, uh, about three to four, some, some of them five, but, you know, um, we try to keep it as small as possible where there are product folks and engineers in, in, in kind of, we have pod, a pod structure within Bond, so various different pods, they handle different parts of the product and um you know we're, we're continuing to try to drive or like less dependencies um it's pretty hard it's actually in order to design pods that are autonomous you actually have to be very thoughtful about uh number one how do you carve out or delineate the different pods number two is what are the interfaces that you can have across pods so that it minimizes kind of uh dependencies and and slowness um, but yeah that that's kind of like small autonomous teams that can make decisions makes sense and Jeff Bezos yeah. had this thing called a two pizza team so if the team is um, cannot be fed by two pizzas is too big <laughs> I love that you know we, we've had heard uh, different methodologies to be able to assess <laughs> kind of team size and scale and structure and you know some folks have talked about you know whether it's seven plus or minus two for uh, you know for when you're managing a team and the, the number of folks you have on the team. Some folks talk about like, you know, making sure that you have a bell curve or like in terms of senior versus not senior people on one side or the other. So it's it's interesting to hear everyone's uh, perspective on, on that subject. This next question from uh, Jeff Lee is, customer service is speed from idea to delivery. So regarding that, what are some key decisions you've made in the past to enhance that speed? And what were the trade-offs in prioritizing it? So I repeat that, that beginning part again. Yeah, sure. So customer service is speed from idea to delivery. When you were kind mm -hmm. of talking about, um, yep. you know, when you're being effective, right? That it's it's really about that that speed to to get there. So what are some key decisions you've made in the past to enhance that speed? I imagine this comes from a place where a lot of folks are struggling with, you know, maybe not going nearly as fast as they want to. Sorry, I have a dog in the background wandering around. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, what yeah. were what were the trade offs in prioritizing it? Yeah, I would say, you know, customer like service is speed from idea to delivery. I think that that's that's correct. I think, you know, sometimes you trade off, you know, delivering kind of the most beautiful product or the most kind of tested product to the end customer. I think um, what I generally see is, you know, great engineers, great product folks, you know, obviously have a pride of ownership. And so what is the point in which you deliver that new thing to your customer? 
And you know, there's always a trade off between, well, let me wait another two sprints before we kind of deliver it so we could kind of work out the rest of the bugs versus, well, let's maybe know that there will be some bugs here, but I want to kind of get the customers, you know, to touch it, play with it, give us some feedback and continue. And so that's always a fine line, um, you know, giving things that are, you know, quote unquote half baked or like less, less mature has its advantages, but also, you know, um, uh, you know, you know, it may per cause a perceived kind of uh, uh, deficiency in the customer's eyes if you kind of do it too early. So I think um, to me, that's kind of the trade off. It depends on the thing you're delivering. And, you know, for example, you know, I think this relates to kind of that type one, type two decision, right? If these are things that we know can iterate and we believe that like from a customer's perspective, you have a lot of trust with that customer already, give something a little bit earlier because they're already using something that they really love from your company and from, from your team. You're, you're building something new right now. And if you have that trust level you, you, with that customer, you could probably give them something a little bit less mature and less tested and you, the, you'll get that benefit of doubt. But if you are talking to <coughs> a new customer, <coughs> excuse me, a new customer that potentially you're trying to win and it's the first time they're like trying to like, use your product, maybe you should do that two more sprints of QA before you actually go give it to the customer. So situation by situation, but um, you know, in general, I agree, like speed to delivery uh, is, is pretty key to customer satisfaction. I'm definitely reminded that clearly none of these things are one size fits all, but you know, you kind of have to do your, do your research and you know, your mileage may vary. Uh, this next question from Benjamin, uh, you know, there are a lot of folks who are working not only with their internal team, but also with external teams. In yeah. some cases, they use external vendors. You know, so the question is, um, you know, what's it been like to integrate external teams into your projects? And if you have any reflections on, like, yeah, how to do that or who to do it with, etc. Yeah. Well, I know our friends Lohika is sponsoring kind of uh, the, the session, and we've been working with Lohika. I've worked with Lohika back in the days of Twilio, and uh, when I started Bond, I also engaged with Lohika. But my philosophy has always been you know, treat the external teams as part of your own team as much as possible. And um, to the extent possible, don't spread them around in such a way that there's one external team member here on this project, another here, but give the team, you know, tangible, ownable projects so that that external team can also own and actually drive outcomes. Because if the external team kind of gets diluted into the kind of rest of the internal teams, I think sometimes it's kind of looked upon as well, they're 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 just kind of like help basically they're they're just helping the internal team but i think if you have great folks like the folks at lohika that we work with you know they're more than capable of owning discrete projects and driving with it and interfacing with you know the other internal teams to kind of drive toward the total solution talking with more and more ctos it's definitely clear to me that you know having this kind of like fully arm's length you know external throw things over a fence kind of thing is a very old way or old style of doing things, even folks that are, you know, thousands of miles away. And as you described, integrating into the team and making them part of the team, you know, and creating whatever boundaries that you need to for, you know, whatever compliance you need for your for your industry, you know, assuming that you, you do that, that the more connection as you describe the, the better. Yeah. Great. Uh, this next question uh, from Peng, I think it relates to one of the previous things that you were talking about in terms of like, Kind of having that that connection or that empathy of of why and the folks above what they need. Um, Peng's wondering how do we know the pain points of our managers and maybe you know one level above them. Ask. <laughs> um, I think that's the first step is to ask. I'm sure you have one on ones with your manager. Um, your manager typically asks how you're doing, right? But um, sometimes, you know, even for me, when someone asks me how I'm doing, it's like, wow, that's a refreshing kind of, uh, you know, let me tell you what how I'm doing, right? Um, yeah, I didn't get any sleep because my 14 month old broke up at four o'clock in the morning. I love to have someone to talk to, right? And so, you know, part of it is ask, um, you know, I think one-on-ones and conversations are two-way streets. And so just like, you know, it is the manager's responsibility to kind of, you know, make sure that you're doing okay as 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 part of uh, their team. But it, it's not it's not it's not it's not off bounds to actually ask your manager how they're doing, and you know, ask them 
what what's happening at the company at the highest level, right? Strategically or otherwise, especially like this time of year, we're in December, right? Most companies are going through planning cycles. I'm sure people are looking at headcount for next year and looking at kind of product roadmap for next year, customer goals for next year. This is the perfect time to kind of ask your manager or people one or two or three levels above you, like, you know, how are we thinking about certain things? Um, and so, you know, in those conversations, pain points will surface. 100%. Thank you so much, Roy, for taking the time to share your wisdom, your thoughts as well. And thank you to Lohika, our sponsor, for giving us the opportunity to chat with you. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, David. Thanks, everyone.